matter. Hello, everyone. Um, if anyone's already introduced me, I'm Becca Cosgriff. So I'm the Consultant Outcomes Publication Project Manager at HWIP, but also the Project Manager for the National Adult Cardiac Surgery Audit at NICOR. Um, Consultant Outcomes Publication, for those of you who haven't been involved in it before, is basically an NHS England initiative to publish analysis of quality measures um, from national clinical audit data down to the level of individual consultant. Um, what I'm going to focus on talking to you guys about today, um, as Kim's already said, is the production of some guidance by HQIP for those national clinical audits involved in consultant outcomes publication and also any others that are interested in um, making patient-friendly charts um, to help them make the analysis that they're putting into the public domain more understandable to patients. So... If you're going to make your charts or anything that you publish um, really useful for the people you're publishing it for, it's really important to understand why you're doing it and what you're hoping to achieve. So in the case of consultant outcomes publication, I've highlighted three of the key aims that we have. Um, the first of those is to improve patient care. Um, and the way that we hope that um, consultant outcomes publication will have this effect is by making sure that information is available down to the level of individual consultant. Um, we can help <coughs> practitioners to have reflection on their practice that's stimulated by competition and the fact that they're held accountable for the results that they have, um, and also appraisal and outlier processes, which will hopefully lead to action planning and implementation, which will go around to improvement and spark off a cycle of improvement, if you will. Um, we also hope that making these data available will ensure and reassure patients that care is being monitored and improved. And we also wanted to support shared decision making. So give patients, their general practitioners and their doctors um, within hospitals the tools they need to make informed decisions about the care that they receive. So before I look at the guidance that we produced in a little bit more detail, I'm just going to give some background about why, after publishing Consultant Outcomes last year, we felt that we needed some formal guidance for all of the projects involved. Um, anyone in the room who was involved in Consultant Outcomes will probably feel that there were more than three challenges. <laughs> um, but I've just, I've just pulled out the main ones, which probably cover a multitude of sins. Um, the top one I always say is short timescales. So NHS England announced that um, these results are going to be published at consultant level in December 2012, they made the announcement that they would be available by June 2013, which for those of you working in clinical audit will know that that's a pretty big turnaround time to work through all of the ideological, methodological challenges and then try and get what you put out there to look reasonable and understandable. So the ideological hurdles were primarily because for nine of the ten audits that were asked to publish at consultant level back in 2013, it was the first time they'd ever done it. Um, so it was understandably a process that made the people running the audits and the individual consultants feel a little bit uneasy about what was going to be put out there, whether it would be misinterpreted or misused. And there were also methodological hurdles. So when you start looking at your data in a lower level of detail than you have before, you might notice issues with data completeness or quality that you hadn't realised were there. You might find that you're not collecting the data set items needed to report at this level of granularity. So a couple of the audits weren't actually collecting GMC codes and had to retrospectively um, gather those. Um, and you've also got things like risk adjustment that you really should try and address if you're going to publish these kind of analysis. Um, so all of that had to be worked through before even the, the projects even started thinking about what their publication was going to look like. In terms of what it should look like, there was a real lack of evidence for best practice when publishing data at this level of detail. So there was a little bit here and there in terms of patient-friendly guides that were already in existence that they could look at, but we didn't have a good evidence base based on patient feedback for what charts should look like to make them understandable to patients when you're looking at individual consultants. Um, the outcome last year, um, first and foremost, was that it was a huge step forward and a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into meeting the June deadline, which the vast majority of the projects did. Um, and it was a world first. And from that world first, we've now got a big spread from 10 projects publishing at consultant level that we can look at in more detail and sort of systematically assess to find out what is best practice going forward. Um, feedback that we had from the media and the public did highlight that we probably needed some guidance to help make the analysis that was out there more understandable to healthcare staff as well as the public and also introduce a little bit more consistency. 
So we set about putting together the COP, Consultant Outcomes Publication, Style Guide for National Clinical Audits. Um, we based it on a process that was as inclusive as possible and gaining feedback from a lot of different sources whilst making sure that the resultant feedback, the resultant guidance was out in a timely fashion so that projects could start using it to work on. So we'd got quite a lot of ad hoc feedback from the public project teams and the media as we went along the process and shortly after publication. We also had a formal consultation period after publication where we did get feedback from the project teams and the public on what they thought about the process and the resultant publication. Um, however, sort of predominantly, we had consultation with the HCRIP service user network, which were really invalu invaluable for making sure we got that patient input that we really needed into how these types of charts should look. And we also had some collaboration with the Royal College of <coughs> Surgeons, the RCS, um, and both the HCRIP Sun and the RCS logos are in the resultant guide so that they endorse what's finally come out. So what I'm going to do next is take you through some of the charts that we asked the service user network to have a look at to help us evolve them into something that they felt was more patient and public friendly. Um, the first step in the process with the service user network was to send them electronically a form that had examples of all of the charts that had already been published by the projects involved in consultant outcomes publication and ask them what they understood the graph to show because often if you just say, do you understand the graph, they might say yes, but be interpreting it in a completely different way than we intend them to. Whether they felt it was easy to reach the conclusion that they had, what they liked about the graph and what they didn't like about the graph. So it was a fairly broad introduction to give us an idea of what they liked and what they didn't like so that we could go away, take their comments on board and try and come up with a draft version of best practice so that they could comment on it in more detail at a, at a subsequent workshop. So what I'm going to show you is what we started with and where we ended up and the changes that we had recommended by the Service User Network. So there were some graphs that we had published in 2013 that the Service User Network felt that they didn't like the basic structure of the graph, so we didn't take though that particular type forward um, to develop any further. And this is an example of one of those, which actually, once you've had it explained to you, is quite easy to understand and does give you the information you need. But I think it goes back to what Rob was talking about, about familiar graphs. And to the patients, this was something that they hadn't seen this type of graph before, and they felt it just was intimidating, and they didn't, they were put off trying to look at it any further because it was so unfamiliar, and some of them thought it was a letter I. Um, there are a few abbreviations and acronyms in there as well that the patients didn't really understand. The good thing about this graph is it does have a table underneath it that allows you to get out the data that has produced the graph, and we've taken that forward in some of the other guidance. So Rob's going to kill me for this one. Uh, this, is a, this is a pie chart. Um, this is from the National Joint Registry, and our, our service user network really liked it. And I think for showing something that's a percentage of a whole, it's quite effective to show you basically the distribution of procedures that are being carried out by a particular consultant. Um, what do you guys think of this? Do you think it's good? Are there any things you like, don't like? It's nice to have percentages. Yeah. Exactly. So if there were two of these sections of the pie that were very similar, you'd still be able to go and look at the actual percentage to see which one's, one's the larger. The feedback we had was that it was great that the percentage was there, but patients were also really interested in to, to know what number that percentage corresponds to and what the total number of procedures the, the pie is made up of. The other feedback we had was that it's great that there's a title and that it shows the time period, but, but what, what is it? Without looking in, in slightly more detail at the graph, it's not immediately apparent to patients what this graph is all about. So it's data. So that was something that we've, we've taken forward and you'll see in the next slide. Um, the other thing that we had, interestingly, was um, the white sections of the chart. Where do they belong? Where do the white sections belong? Does that belong to knee primary or does it belong to hip revision? So we, we, we took those out in subsequent versions. So this is the, the second iteration that we had. Um, so we've, we've separated out the title, so we've got a slightly more descriptive title at the top, and we've retained the time period. We've given the total number of procedures underneath, and as you can see, we've taken out the white sections, and we've added the actual number as well as the percentage to each of the sections. We've played around with the colours a little bit as well. And then our final version was just a sort of tweak of that second one, where we've played around again with the colours based on the feedback that we got, and the actual pie is slightly bigger, so it makes it a bit more easy to, to tell apart the different sections. 
Okay, so that's pie charts. Uh, bar charts. So this is showing actually something very similar to the pie chart. It's basically the, the distribution of procedures that a consultant has carried out. This is from the um, adult cardiac surgery audit. Any thoughts on that one? Anyone wants to shout out? Good or bad? I'm not precious. Yeah? Well, exactly. If you look at the, these two, even on my screen on the computer, actually, they're quite hard to tell apart. So black and white, is that's definitely going to be a no. Becca, Becca, sorry, could you repeat the question? Because we'll lose it otherwise when the comment that comes back to you. Oh, just whether, yeah, whether it will um, print in black and white very effectively, which it, it probably wouldn't have done. Um, other things, we, I mean, we've got a, a kind of descriptive title, but whether case mix means a lot to people is questionable. We've got the date range in there. We haven't got a label on both of the axes. And also the number of procedures that are going up here are quite big. So if you want to look, get some kind of detailed information, it's quite difficult. And it's, it would be quite hard from that chart to actually think about how many isolated mitral valve procedures have been carried out. You could get an approximation, but not an actual number. So we took this to the service user network. We played around with the colours a little bit, but don't be perturbed because they didn't stay that way. <laughs> um, we've tried to keep the same title format across all the graphs to get some consistency and just retain that kind of best practice that we'd got from the service user network. So we've got the total number of procedures there. We've got a slightly more granular axes going at the top. We've got the labels on both of the axes. Um, and I think, I think those, those are the main changes there. And then in our final version, change the colours again to make them a bit more obviously different, even if printed in black and white. Um, and the main change otherwise from the, from the previous version is we've actually got the numbers as well as the percentages. So it was 97 of procedure one have been carried out. Okay. I'm going on to the controversial topic of funnel plots, question mark. <laughs> um, so our, the feedback we had from the service user network was that they didn't really like funnel plots. But I know that other patient groups have given different feedback. And I also know that as a medical profession, it would be quite difficult to snap my fingers and ask everyone to stop using funnel plots. So what we felt was that rather than try and tell everyone to stop using funnel plots and then almost certainly going off and doing it anyway, that we should try and develop a best practice funnel plot that people could use. So if you're going to use them, at least make it as good as possible. And we also developed an alternative based on other examples that were already around. So this is the original. This is the National Joint Registry again, which is pretty good. It's pretty clear. Um, some nice bold lines in there, decent colours. Um, you've got a clear arrow showing you the consultant that you're actually looking at at that particular time, clear title, etc. And there's a few things like what's, what's CL, those kind of inherent problems you get. So apologies for the busy slide. This is to show you the best practice version of the funnel plot that we had evolving, as, long as, our, as well as our alternative risk-adjusted mortality rate plot. So these are risk-adjusted, which is why we've only got one dot on the funnel. So we've played around with the titles again on the funnel plots. As well as having an arrow showing you which consultant you're looking at, we've added the total number of procedures and the percentage, so it's very clear. Labels on both of the axes. And we've got a shorter possible explanation of what's going on underneath the plot. So it's immediately there. The idea being, if you wanted more information, you would find that elsewhere. Um, on the plot on my right... <laughs> Too long, left. Um, we've got an, an alternate version that our service user network actually much preferred, which is it's basically the same information. You've still got the national average, which is the green line, you've got the control limit at the far end, and you've got the consultant you're looking at is the purple bar, and the same sort of explanation underneath. So these did have an evolution as well. So some feedback that we got from the, our first version of the funnel plot was that patients weren't completely clear. If the dot was here, is that still okay? Is that, it's, it's kind of near the red. Does that mean it's amber? What's going on there? So we made the decision that everything that was within expected should be shaded green just to indicate it's okay, it's fine. Um, I think that was the main change we made there. I think our, our title's a little bit more descriptive than the previous version. And we've tried to make it kind of insert your procedure here so that people can use them. Um, otherwise, I think we, we stayed kind of the same with the other one. Oops. So that's, that's that. Does anyone? I might take questions at the end, maybe about some of okay. 
Okay, so not to neglect tables. I'm not going to bore you with the evolution of our table. Um, but I think it's easy to make an assumption that just because it's a table, it's easy to understand and you don't have to think about it too much. But actually, if you've got a table that's got 250 rows, no guidelines, all one colour, I personally find it really difficult to follow a line across if you've got five columns. So it's really important to think about having shading and guidelines to differentiate between your rows, still making sure that all of your column headers are descriptive, and give your table itself, make sure your table's still got a title, just because it's intrinsically possibly more simple doesn't mean it doesn't need a title and a date range, and also an explanation. So we've still got risk-adjusted mortality rates in this table, so it's important to make sure you've got that explanation there. So it's just a reminder about tables. Um, Kim's already showed you um, my chart design checklist, which I've condensed slightly just to fit on the slide. Um, some really basic principles that are very easy to forget when you're really familiar with what you're doing, because you're all experts in the national clinical audits you work on. It's sometimes easy to not keep things simple. Um, it's important to remember to use familiar graph types, which Rob's already talked about. Use bold, bright colours that can print in black and white. Clear lines. Use colours consistently. So if you label um, a particular procedure green in one chart, try and keep it green in all of your charts throughout the report. Otherwise, it can be a bit confusing. Give your chart a descriptive title, label different parts of the graph, and make so, sure that all of your chart has appropriate labels. Show a date, date range, use a decent sized font. Using 12 can be difficult if you're in a web format, but just make sure it's readable. Avoid abbreviations, and if you can, give a tabular version of what you're showing in your chart underneath it, because it just makes it easier to, to digest. And it means that people who just don't like charts have got that table underneath that they can refer to. Um, have I got time? Um, so this is just to show an example of one of the projects, which is adult cardiac surgery, where, where we've tried to start moving towards meeting the requirements of the style guide. So it's not perfect, but we're the first of the projects to update our information in 2014. So assuming this works. This is going to be hard for me to get around on the screen. Okay, so these are the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery um, patient pages, which are populated by data from the National Adult Cardiac Surgery Audit, and we have input into the content of. So we've, we've changed the format of the pages a bit to make them more patient-friendly. So the font size is bigger on these pages than it is elsewhere on the website. Elsewhere on the website is tiny, but sadly I, they won't let me change those bits. We've got quite a lot of information on this page about resources that are available to patients um, from the National Clinical Audit. Um, I'm just... Where's my mouse going? Oh, my mouse is back on here now. Oh, there we go. And what we wanted to avoid was having a massive long page that people had to scroll all the way down. So it's fairly basic, but we've just got an accordion um, that you can expand. Simple things that make a big difference. We've also tried to make it as obvious as possible if you're looking for consultant outcomes publication data, where it is on the website. Because for some of the audits, it's a little bit tricky to find the analysis if that's what you're looking for. And that includes the NHS Choices website at the moment, actually. Um, so hopefully it's fairly obvious. But if you're interested in surgeon results, you go to surgeon profiles. I'm just going to pick on um, Kamar because he's the first one on the list. So this is a surgeon profile page. And we've used the same kind of accordion view. Because this collapses the page, it means that we've been able to add a short explanation above each of the graphs, which we didn't have before because we were concerned about the page getting too long. Um, it should be fairly obvious from the titles what the expanded image is going to look to show you so that you can click on what you're interested in. And then this is our chart. So it's an improvement on last year, I think. So we've got a bit of a gap between each of the columns, so it's easier to tell them apart. What we haven't got at the moment is the numbers on the top, which we'll add. Um, and the title of the graph is actually in the expandable section. Um, and then you can go...
the risk-adjusted in-hospital mortality rate. And again, we've made improvements from last year, but we don't exactly mimic what's in the, um, the style guide. And that's partly because we've still got some development work to do before the deadline in October, but also just to show you that it's a guide. If you're developing these kind of graphs, they don't have to look exactly like the ones in the style guide. It's all about taking the general principles and applying them in a way that suits your audit and your, the conditions that you cover, and also matches the patient feedback that you might get from your own groups that are specific to the conditions that you look at. So it's not that the style guide that we've produced should override any information that you get from your own patient consultation. Basically, that final section shows the risk profile of the individual consultants and also the hospitals, if you're in the hospital level section. And, and what that gives you is an idea of whether the consultant that you're looking at operates um, specialist practice. So they do, do they take on particularly high-risk procedures? If you're having surgery on a thoracic aorta, does this particular consultant do a lot of those? And it also shows you, in general, does this, patient, does this consultant operate on high-risk patients? And it helps, hopefully, to contextualise the risk-adjusted mortality rate that we show above it. So I'll give it one more go. <laughs> You'll have the link, I'm sure you can, you can find it and have a look at it. But they're basically, they're, com they're comparative histograms. So you've got the consultant that you're looking at on the left and the national average on the right. So it just help gives you a, a basic eyeball view of whether they are above or below the national average in terms of taking on those kinds of patients. So that's it from me. <laughs> Thanks very much.